Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the state of New Jersey, the Honorable Thomas H. Kane. Thank you very much, Mr. Senate President Carmen Arecchio, uh, Speaker Alan Karcher, uh, members of the legislature, and friends. You have before you a, a printed message. Uh, there is no way, without imposing intolerably on your time, that I could have gotten in all the recommendations that are in that particular message. So I would ask if you please could peruse it and look at the various proposals that I will not have a chance to get to today in this formal message. Two years, if you remember, I stood before you on a cold and a blustery day, and I raised my hand so that the Chief Justice of this state could swear me into this great office. On that occasion, I told you that we, we would face together a time of great testing for New Jersey and a time of great testing for our government. We feared a host of problems led by the worst economic times to face this nation since the Great Depression. Now, in this my second report on the state of the state, I can tell you that we have not only weathered the storm, but we have emerged with a fresh breeze in our sails. We are matching or surpassing our neighboring states. The state of the state is good. But being first today is not enough for tomorrow. We now have a further task. We have to plan so that we can ensure our future prosperity. We have built the foundation. It is now time to set our sights on the horizon. Today, I can report to you that more New Jerseyans are employed than at any other time in our state's history, that our unemployment rate is three points lower than it was and is well below that of the nation as a whole, that construction contracts are up 50 percent from a year ago, and that home building is running 104 percent above last year's rates. Most importantly, New business incorporations, the best sign of confidence in our state's future, are running almost 20 percent ahead. And yet, there's another sign that came in just this morning. I'm pleased to announce to you today that the both bond rating services today have reconfirmed New Jersey, one of the only eight states in the entire country, to maintain a triple-A bond rating. And all this didn't just happen by accident. Bringing jobs to New Jersey, keeping those we already have, have been at my top priority, as it's know it's been your top priority for the past two years. To bring those jobs to the state, we've reduced taxes on business, we've offered low interest loans, and we've promoted the state aggressively for the first time in our history. As part of our effort, we have launched two major programs to train displaced workers, the economically disadvantaged and the working poor. In addition, we've launched the largest highway construction and repair program in our state's history. And this year, we have demonstrated that the years of standing behind other states for federal highway funds are over, and that the time has passed when roads remain unbuilt 
while federal funds allocated to New Jersey remain unclaimed. In this fiscal year, we are spending $451 million to improve our roads. We are doing projects that have been delayed for years. I've been able to assure businessmen, people who want to create jobs in our state, that if they locate or expand in New Jersey, they're going to be able to move their goods and their services. Transportation, and never forget it, transportation holds the key to this state's economic future. By maintaining an excellent transportation network, we attract and we keep jobs, and we can distribute all our products that much more efficiently. In the last legislative session, however, you failed to set up a stable source of funding for transportation. Last year's program, which I've described, was based on funds that were used from the 1979 bond issue. After July, we're still going to be eligible for millions of dollars, more than ever before, but we will not have the state funds required to match them unless you act. We cannot return to a policy of putting off until tomorrow what we should have done yesterday. The Infrastructure Bank still does not exist, despite the crying need for such a fund, despite the national praise for this proposal, despite the fact that several leaders of this government have testified in Washington about its many benefits, and despite the fact that the federal government is considering a bill to emulate it. I would challenge this legislature either to improve on the Infrastructure Bank proposal or to approve it. But don't sit on it. The further we allow our roads and our bridges and our waterways and our sewers to deteriorate, the more it's going to cost to repair them. And if you choose to ignore the problem, if you choose to bury your heads in the sand, you are likely to find the infrastructure then crumbling about your very ears. A sound physical foundation is the basic effect for a sound economy, and to help create that foundation, I have recently made agreement with the Atlantic City Expressway to provide us with surplus revenues for a vital South Jersey transportation projects. Senator Walter Rand is planning to introduce the required legislation, and I would urge your support. I'm also negotiating with the New Jersey Turnpike Authority and the New Jersey Highway Authority in an effort to reach similar agreements. The agreements we hope to reach with all three authorities will provide us a source of funding for projects that would otherwise be neglected. And there's another urgent matter which we can no longer ignore, unemployment insurance reform. Our current debt imperils that very important fund's future. At the same time, it serves as a major disincentive to new companies who would otherwise locate in our state. I've appointed a commission composed of distinguished representatives of both business and labor. I hope that for their report in the near future, and I stand ready to work with you for implementation of the reforms they propose. It's you know, it's very important for all of us to remember that in spite of our continuing recovery, in spite of the seeming prosperity, there are still those in our, who, in our state who want to work and who simply can't find jobs. We can never be satisfied in this state until every New Jersey citizen willing to work is able to get a decent job that earns a decent salary. If this is to happen, we must now turn our attention to our cities. They have not shared in our economic growth. And yet I believe that if we are to have continuing prosperity as a state, we simply cannot abandon our cities. <laughs> Several of our initiatives last year were aimed particularly at our cities. And in particular, I congratulate you on the passage of our Urban Enterprise Zone Bill. I would urge our United States Congress to follow the lead of the New Jersey legislature. 
In this administration, we've been working with various cities, trying to maximize their individual strengths. In all our cities, we are working, for instance, to develop around transportation centers. But to date, there's been no overall effort to coordinate our urban initiatives, no single entity to formulate an overall urban strategy. Therefore, today, I would like to propose the establishment of a statewide urban development corporation to develop and coordinate our programs for rebuilding the cities. I don't envision a great cost being associated with such a corporation. Its directives could be carried out by existing program staff and the state's executive departments and agencies. Its charge would be not necessarily demand, to demand new resources from us or from you in the legislature, but more effectively to use those resources we are now devoting to the cities. Its purpose would not then necessarily be to spend more money, but to target and coordinate what we're spending already. By establishing such a corporation, I believe we can turn our collection of good faith efforts to solve urban problems into a forceful, comprehensive urban development strategy, a strategy targeted to meet the particular needs of individual cities. Finally, there is one city with special urban problems. Casino gambling, with its immense profits, has yet to fulfill its promise to Atlantic City. I urge you to act promptly on our reinvestment credit proposal so that these promises can be kept. Legal gaming does not mean that any of us can trifle or play games with the life of a city or the life of its people. I will tell you now that I'm willing to compromise on various portions of my proposal, but on a couple of areas I feel very strongly. First of all, that 15 percent of the monies reinvested be used exclusively for housing for low- and middle-income residents. Housing conditions, <laughs> housing conditions in Atlantic City simply have to be improved. And secondly, that the monies that have been raised and spent over the long term go exclusively to the eight counties comprising South Jersey. In my mind, the state has neglected South Jersey in too many ways for much too long, and this is one way that we can make up for this past neglect. It is also important for all our citizens that government operate effectively and that those public employees who are truly exceptional be singled out and be rewarded. Let me appeal to you again for civil service reform. You know that those laws have not changed substantially since 1908. This is not a partisan issue. Governors Minor, Hughes, Cahill, and Byrne all agree on this one. Since the civil service laws were written, we have fought two world wars, we have emerged as a superpower, and grown dramatically as a state. This stagnation in our civil service system is a disgrace. It's also ridiculous. This legislature can be the agent of reform, and this reform would be a lasting gift to the state of New Jersey. When I took office, New Jersey's prison system was teetering on the brink of chaos. A decade of neglect had left our state institutions and ne nearly every county jail filled to the bursting point. Quick and effective action spared New Jersey the specter of prison riots that struck so many other states. We are also spared the chilling news heard so much these days elsewhere that violent criminals released by court order from overcrowded jails have found new victims, sometimes even within hours of their release. This state will not tolerate criminal aggression against the innocent. This state's purpose is not to avenge for vengeance's sake. 
but to prevent and deter further harm to its members and its citizens. Crime was down in New Jersey last year for the second year in a row, and I believe that you, the legislature of this state, deserve substantial credit for that fact, because I believe tougher laws that you enacted account for a large part and large measure for that drop. Particularly significant are the package of bills that you passed and I signed to deal more sternly with juvenile criminals. The creation of the new family court was a distinguished achievement and Senator Graves' bill to deter crime against the elderly and disabled sends a clear signal to the criminals in our society that we will not tolerate the singling out of the weak and the vulnerable as their victims. I must say, however, that I am sadly disappointed at the actions, or rather your lack of them, last night that spell defeat for some of the most important legislation to be considered during the last legislative term. Drunk driving is one of the deadliest afflictions to plague our society. You began to deal with that problem last year. Positive action on bills to prohibit open containers of alcoholic beverages and automobiles and to make a blood alcohol level of 0.10 proof of drunkenness were very excellent first steps. I had high hopes before last night's session that the 200th session of this legislature would end with a truly distinguished record in dealing with this terrible social ill. However, your failure last night to pass legislation establishing the, the Drunk Driving Enforcement Fund, I believe is a real disservice to the people of this state. It is bad enough that we now lack the Enforcement Fund, which would have provided an important new source of revenue to fund the efforts of local police to enforce the drunk driving laws. But what to me is worse is that this failure has also doomed the liquor tax, which would have provided financing for important alcohol-related rehabilitation programs and the intoxicated driver resource centers, which many of you have spoken out on and seen as important enforcement tools in our fight against drunk driving. I cannot overemphasize my hope that you will make these bills your very first priority in your new term. The toll taken by drunken drivers in this state and in the country is a tragedy, but it is a tragedy that all of us can take action to prevent. Please. Don't let these bills fall victim to any kind of partisan disputes. They're far too important. We must, together, we must make New Jersey known throughout the nation as the state which will not, under any circumstances, tolerate a drunken driver. I think one of the saddest events that we experience in today's society is to pick up the morning newspaper and read of some innocent person who has been murdered, raped, beaten, or robbed of their life savings, and the subsequent arrest of a convicted criminal, only to find out that that criminal is out on bail awaiting trial for another violent crime. During last session, I urge you to act on legislation which would lead to the detention without bail of convicted violent criminals charged with similar violent crimes. That bill made substantial progress, but was not passed. I again urge you to consider that measure. It can save innocent lives. I cannot believe that working together, we can't devise a system which will protect the rights of the innocent, at least as well as the rights of the criminal. In 1983, after a lot of hard work and compromise, we made the first progress in years in the area of automobile insurance reform. The bills that you passed and that I signed into law, I expect to save the average motorist, as you do also, almost $150 when all their various provisions take effect. And I'd like to pause here for just one minute. You know, in the finest traditions of this legislature, there are often individuals who stand out because of their singular interest and singular devotion to one particular subject. I think in those terms of Senator Beadleston and his work for the handicapped, 
I think of Senators Bateman and Assemblyman Burstein on education. You have in your midst one of those who has devoted himself to the subject of insurance and who stands out in that subject. Whether or not you agree or disagree with particular points that are made that he makes, I think Mike Garabato deserves our respect for his work on insurance in this state. There remains, however, much to be done if we are really interested in serving the best interests of New Jersey's motorists. I asked you last year for a medical fee schedule to control the unlimited medical costs now associated with auto insurance. I ask you again to pass such a law. I asked you, as did my predecessor, for a verbal threshold on tort liability. I would ask for that threshold again. While the environment and the economy often are presented in things we hear and read as competing interests. I have known for a long time that in New Jersey, the environment and the economy are inextricably bound together. A healthy economy depends, I believe, on a healthy environment. In that regard, let me congratulate you, and especially to congratulate Senator Dan Dalton on last year's passage of the Worker and Community Right to Know Act. It has put New Jersey in the forefront I do believe that safe jobs are the best jobs for New Jersey. The problems, of tox the problems of toxic waste will not go away, and certainly we can't ignore them. While New Jersey has been recognized for its national leadership on this front, we still have so very much to do. When the Congress passed the law authorizing Superfund in 1980, it simply underestimated the size and complexity of the problem. The existence of Superfund has been pivotal in identifying the size and scope of the problem and in preparing plans for controlling and cleaning up the sites. But if we are to complete the actual cleanup of the nation's and the state's worst sites, then we both must reauthorize and enlarge Superfund. Now that we have a clear idea of the task before us, this is a more urgent priority than ever before. New Jersey's United States Senators, Bill Bradley and Frank Lautenberg, have introduced a bill that would extend the life and increase the size of Superfund. All of us who call ourselves New Jerseyans should unite behind the bill and should work for its passage. In the meantime, we have so much work to do in this area here, here in the state. We must approach the siting of new hazardous waste facilities in the most professional and in the most dispassionate way. In this regard, I would ask for your further support for the Hazardous Waste Siting Commission. I would ask you also to support a new initiative, one that will enable us to pay greater attention to the health effects of exposure to toxic materials at various sites around the state. The program which I plan to propose will allow us to conduct comprehensive medical screening programs at sites throughout New Jersey. It will also create a toxic substance registry that will give medical experts the ability to track the health status of New Jersey citizens, to help them determine the causes of cancer and other environmentally related diseases. But a comprehensive program to address the relationship between hazardous materials and public health risks simply must do more. It must actively seek to prevent overexposure to toxic substances. Accordingly, in the coming year, I propose that we undertake several initiatives to prevent unsafe levels of exposure. First, despite recent federal activity that has raised the question of preemption of state statutes, we must follow through on the action we took last year in passing New Jersey's right to NOLA and move forward strongly to implement and protect that right. As you know, we recently filed suit with other interested parties in federal court to challenge the right of the federal government to adopt regulations that are weaker than ours. Secondly, I will shortly establish a commission on risk assessment to recommend toxic contaminant exposure levels. Our citizens face the possibility of exposure to a range of toxic contaminants in a wide variety of situations. Third, we will proceed with the effort to set standards to ensure that the water our citizens drink is safe. As you know, you enacted at the end of last session a very good bill, which I signed, which calls for such an effort. 
Clean drinking water is the most vital of our natural resources. In many ways, it is our lifeblood. We must act now to ensure its continued supply and the continued integrity of that supply. Some environmental crises, such as hazardous waste disposal, attract attention and literally demand a response. In New Jersey, we have a record of progress on these issues both at the legislative and at the executive levels. On some issues, however, we have no cause for self-congratulation. Solid waste is such an issue. For years, we have run away from the hard choices required for a solution. Solid waste has been in crisis in New Jersey for 10 years. In the last one and a half years, we've had to make a series of hard decisions to come to grips with the crisis. But we've also been working in a bipartisan way to come up with solutions. These solutions are more vital than ever. In just a few years, the issue will no longer be which county takes which garbage. Instead, it'll be where to find room to put any of our garbage, even if we agree to share this burden equally. Legislation designed to prepare us for the next phase of solid waste management and to declare the way for resource recovery is now ready for your consideration. I hope you will consider it as early as possible in the new session. Garbage is one of the most important problems of the 80s in New Jersey. We can no longer walk away from the problem. It's arrived on our doorstep. There's no question there'll be a high cost to taking a responsible approach to solid waste and resource recovery. My contention is that we must be prepared to bear it. For the costs of taking an irresponsible approach will be much, much greater. Nobody likes garbage. Everyone creates it. Everyone must cope with it. Increasingly, I worry about the capabilities of our ocean to absorb additional dredge spoils. Our shore is one of New Jersey's treasures. We cannot ignore the consequences of dumping off our shore for any longer. As Assemblyman Villain has pointed out so well and so often, our fishing and tourism industries are far too important to the people of this state and our economy to be put at risk. The Environmental Protection Agency is considering a move to require that material from New York Harbor have to be dumped at a site 106 miles out. This is essential to the continued health of the New Jersey shore, and I would call on EPA to immediately adopt that rule. Finally, I continue to be concerned about a menace beyond our borders. Acid rain is now affecting our crops, our pine lands, the lakes of the Northwest, and even the public buildings in our cities. I call on our congressional delegation to take the lead in supporting a national solution to this problem before our economy or our environment is damaged any further. It is an axiom that any decent society is judged by the way it cares for its less fortunate members. As John Kennedy reminded us when he began his all too brief term in office, if a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it'll never sa save the few who are rich. New Jersey has a long and well-deserved reputation for caring for its sick, its elderly, and its handicapped. I'm proud that during this administration we've extended this tradition and I continue, continue to, con, intend to continue it as long as I am governor. Money is important for these programs, but equally vital is an element of humanity, the heart and soul with which we provide that help. I believe we need a new approach, one that will prevent our social and physical ills rather than simply treating them after they happen, one that will view institutions as a last resort and never is the easy solution, one that will keep our needy in their communities and involve those communities in caring for our needy citizens. Some of our prevention programs are already underway. The Department of Human Services will send almost, spend almost $3 million this year to prevent family violence through greater involvement in and by the community. My 19-member task force on child abuse is already at work studying methods to prevent all forms 
of child abuse. It is my hope that these two groups will be as catches in the rye, catching children at the top of the cliff instead of stretching out a so-called safety net after they've already fallen. Our Division on Mental Retardation is working with private groups, developing strategies to prevent retardation through better nutrition, education, and treatment. But one of the least humane aspects of the manner in which we have in the past aided the needy was the way in which government tore families apart and forced those receiving our assistance to leave their homes and their loved ones and move into institutions. This year, with your help, we began to change that direction with the creation of the Community Care, care Waiver Program, in other words, home health care. It will allow the aged, the handicapped, and mentally retarded to remain in their homes and in their communities while still receiving the Medicaid assistance they need and the Medicaid assistance which they truly deserve. We're moving now toward a day when families will no longer be faced with the agonizing choice of placing their loved ones in an institution or being forced to forego the financial and medical assistance which they must have. In the coming, coming year, I think we must carry that idea one step further. One of the cruelest aspects of long-term institutional care is the private pay contract, which forces families of senior citizens who want to enter a nursing home and who are eligible for Medicaid to sign contracts with much higher patient rates. Those higher rates, in some cases as much as $2,000 a month, are exacted as a price of Medicaid admission to nursing homes. It is a vicious practice and it should be stopped. Accordingly, I will ask your support this coming year for legislation which would make it a crime for a nursing home operator to require a medical el Medicaid eligible patient or that patient's family to sign a private pay contract as a condition of admission. Families must no longer be pushed to the brink of financial ruin in order to gain care for their loved ones. New Jersey has a continuing commitment to finance the study and treatment of any variety of illnesses and conditions. I believe that there's a clear corollary to that belief, to finance treatment of conditions that arise from circumstances that produce tax revenues for the state. For example, I have recently supported, as have most of you, legislation to allow funds from a tax on alcohol to be used to provide treatment for education on alcoholism. Similarly, I supported, and you passed, legislation to fund cancer research from cigarettes tax monies. Now I believe the time has come to extend that principle into another area from which the state derives substantial monies, casino gambling. Compulsive gambling is a disease with personal and social implications every bit as terrible as alcoholism. It can destroy families, it can destroy individuals, and it can weak weaken the fabric of our society. As you know, our Constitution today doesn't require, it doesn't allow casino revenues to be used for this purpose. I believe, however, that such a program is a legitimate use of these funds. Consequently, I will propose to you this year an amendment to our Constitution to allow a portion of the casino revenue funds to be used for the treatment and rehabilitation of compulsive gamblers, and I strongly urge your support for this proposal. <laughs> 1983 was a year that produced an unprecedented amount of attention on upgrading the quality of teaching in our schools, and the skills of our students. It was a year that produced any number of national reports, all of which decried the declining performance of our schools and the declining performance of our students. As one report put it, if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. 
I served on one of the task forces which issued those reports. I serve on the steering committee of the Education Commission of the States, and I sit on the Assessment Policy Committee of the National Assessment of Educational Progress. I spoke at the plenary session of the National Conference on Excellence in Education, and I had visited any number of the schools throughout this state. From these first-hand experiences, I can assure you that every bit of attention that we wish to fasten on education is well warranted. I have told you many times why it must be our pressing concern, and one which we only ignore at our own peril. While most New Jerseyans agree with me, there are some who say we do not really have problems in our schools. I would ask them if they are willing to stake their future of their children on what we have now, on the status quo. This fall, I gave you my blueprint for educational reform with a three-point program to revise teacher certification, teacher salaries, and professional development of teachers. The program has been praised around the country as a sound approach to education. New Jersey is now regarded as a national leader. The current Secretary of Education endorses our proposals, and a former Secretary of Education will lead one of our efforts to implement them. We have a new testing system, a new graduation test, and a totally new approach to thorough and efficient education. Commissioner Cooperman has not rested in his campaign to provide the best possible education for students in New Jersey. What I believe we have to now make sure is that the best education possible doesn't leave anybody out, that it includes the children of our cities. We have a new Urban Advisory Council for Education, and we are now ready to launch a major drive to reform urban education in this state. The program I am proposing recognizes the many elements of the difficulties facing urban educators. It recognizes the need to set and adhere to the same rigorous standards for urban students as for all others. At the same time, however, it will help us design and create the kind of support structure that will better help urban youngsters develop all of their rich potential. And it will help us deal directly with some of the social problems, such as drug and alcohol abuse, which although a problem I believe in every school district in this state, is a specially destructive force in our urban schools. I have therefore directed the Department of Education to come forward with a workable plan for implementing this important urban initiative, and to do so no later than March of this year. This will be an ambitious proposal because I believe we have to face directly the problems of our urban schools. There are models of successful urban programs around the country, lessons which we can apply here in New Jersey. The point is, that urban education and those children deserve our full attention. This year, they will get it. <laughs> While education has been at the center of our attention this past year, for far too many years, higher education has been relegated to the bottom of New Jersey's list of priorities. As you look back and budget after budget after budget, higher education has been asked to stand in line behind all the other departments. This policy has been foolish, and if it were to continue, it would severely damage our state's future. The relationship between New Jersey's economic well-being and the quality of its system of higher education is indisputable. To attract students, we must be able to attract jobs. To attract jobs, we must be able to attract students. If we are to prevent New Jersey's best minds from being lured out of state, we must strengthen the bonds between higher education and private industry. Last year, we started to address the years of neglect from which the state system of higher education had suffered. Higher education, as you remember, was one of only three departments that even in the midst of a great recession, we recommended for some increase. Let us today build further on that progress we started last year. Let us plot a strategy for the future in higher education. We must begin, I believe, by forming a new partnership 
between higher education and economic development. Industry and academia must come together. In 1982, I appointed the Governor's Science and Technology Commission, a bipartisan group made of leaders from our top colleges and universities, business, labor, and government. Some of you are members, Senator Lynch, Senator Ewing, Assemblyman Gill, and Assemblyman Doria. Sturve served with distinction on that fine commission. Last week, the commission forwarded its final recommendations to me. Chief among them is a call for the approval of an $80 million higher education and technology bond issue to help finance the initiatives, reforms, and improvements necessary to carry New Jersey with strength into the age of high technology. I call on you today to enact legislation to place this bond issue on the ballot in 1984. The Commission also recommends, and I will support, the establishment of four academic industrial centers for advanced technology. I therefore propose that we create a center in biotechnology on the adjoining campuses of Rutgers University and the University of Medicine and Dentistry, a center in hazardous and toxic substance management in Newark through a consortium of institutions led by the New Jersey Institute of Technology, a multidisciplinary center in ceramics at Rutgers University, a multidisciplinary center in food technology and agricultural science at Cook College. I believe that creating these four centers, and possibly a fifth center, will not only thrust New Jersey into national leadership role in each of these research areas, but it will serve as a key stimulus for the creation of jobs. In addition to these centers, I recommend a program of grants to stimulate research and specific subject of concerned industry. I will propose in my fiscal 1985 budget that the state fund a special program for retraining and improving the knowledge of teachers already certified in math and science, and to train teachers certified in other areas who have now to meet the shortage moved into the classroom, and even though in some ways unprepared, are now teaching math and science. I believe these funds could also be used to retrain college faculty to teach computer sciences, another area in which we have a severe shortage. I will also recommend that our colleges reallocate resources to develop a program that will encourage the exchange of faculty and qualified personnel with industry. Reallocated funds should be used, I think, to provide stipends to faculty who would like to gain some private sector experience and to allow experts from the private sector to cross-pollinate to go on to those college campuses. Finally, I recommend that we require of all college students courses designed to foster technological literacy. And I think all our students to graduate from college ought to have at least minimal competence with a computer. To compete in tomorrow's world, our students simply must be trained in tomorrow's technology. This, however, cannot be the limits of our educational mission. There are other objectives needed for survival in, these complex, in this complex world, particularly those we seek in a liberal education. To develop creative, independent, and critical thought, we simply must develop a human dimension in our learning. It is this dimension that Jacques Bozen would say turns grammar into literature, a list of dates into history, and a sheet of formulas into the national sciences. So in addition to a program to upgrade technological training in New Jersey, I'll be proposing a program to enhance education in the humanities. I Finally, in this area, we must demand more from the students at our institutions of higher learning if they had to earn the reputations that we feel they deserve. I mean by this that we must stiffen our standards for regular admissions into any four-year baccalaureate program, and that we should adopt more rigorous requirements for graduation from these programs, and that we must broaden our curriculum, broaden that curriculum which students have to complete before they graduate. Also, urban students 
have historically been underrepresented in fields requiring a high level of proficiency in science and mathematics, and that has hurt them when they've tried to get jobs. So I ask for your support in programs developing programs to encourage minority students, people from our cities, to pursue these fields in pre-collegiate years to help address that underrepresentation. Many of these higher education initiatives I've outlined are designed to enhance the reputation and the excellence of our institutions in order to attract more New Jersey students home to our own institutions. I would like to propose one final program to encourage our best students to attend college here in New Jersey, a Garden State Merit Scholarship Program, which would award grants of $1,000 a year to outstanding New Jersey students who wish to attend New Jersey institutions. I believe then that we must work together, all of us, to redress the past neglect of higher education in New Jersey. The program I have outlined here will not only improve the quality of our institutions and enable us to retain more of New Jersey's talent, it will help to bring jobs to our state. I am suggesting nothing less than you and I dedicate ourselves to the goal of making our system of higher education the very best in this nation. One of this century's great thinkers, fleeing persecution from violence, sought refuge in our shores and found it here in our state. He made his home not far from here, in Princeton, where he was free to think and free to speak as he thought. On the 300th anniversary of higher education in America, the wisest of men said, that knowledge must continually be renewed in ceaseless effort if it is not to be lost. That man was Albert Einstein, one of the greatest minds of our times. He saw that knowledge stands like a statue on a desert cliff. It is in constant peril of being buried under the sands of time, and it is saved and renewed only by willing hands, which serve that the marble may shine, uncovering that knowledge anew. Let us then pledge with Einstein that to these serving hands, mine shall also belong. Let our schools, colleges, and universities act as beacons to guide our various journeys. Let them light the way into safe harbors, or perhaps even into new adventures. Einstein found a safe home here. But 200 years ago, this nation's safety and existence were not safe at all. They were, in fact, in peril. This year, I helped to celebrate, as some of you did also, the bicentennial of the Treaty of Paris, remembering that this was the very first act that we did as a sovereign state, as this democracy. New Jersey then housed the nation's capital and its Congress. And one of the treaty's authors, John Jay, sent a message to New Jersey's governor, then Governor Livingston. What Jay said was, the eyes of the world are upon America. Their consideration will depend on the dignity and the wisdom of our conduct. I believe in keeping New Jersey first and foremost, but first place is a very demanding position, and the eyes of this nation are going to be on New Jersey as she leads. Together, let us lead New Jersey with wisdom and with dignity to a more perfect freedom. Now, now is New Jersey's time to take pride in her past, take action for its presence, for the present, and to take thought for our future. Join me. Come together in our dreams for our state. 1984 is no longer a threatening nightmare. Today, 1984 stands as a promise for New Jersey, a promise I believe that's about to be fulfilled. Thank you very much.
presentation to make. It's a commemorative plate, Your Honor. You've been watching Governor Tom Kane's State of the State Address. In the address, the governor spoke for almost 50 minutes and he said the state of the state is good. In his message, he said one of his foremost proposals is the passage of an $80 million higher education and technology bond issue this year to create a host of uh, educational reforms. Kane will also call for the creation of a state urban development corporation, further auto insurance reforms, civil service revisions, and a strategy to deal with dwindling landfill space. The New Jersey Network will continue its coverage of Governor Kane's State of the State message tonight at 8 o'clock when we will rebroadcast the governor's message in its entirety and we'll also have the response of Democratic leaders to the governor's message. And you can also look for further coverage of the governor's State of the State message tonight on New Jersey Nightly News. I'm Larry Stupnagel. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Unto God's gracious mercy.